Okay. Got it. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you about uh, the geometric approach to the standard model effective field theory. This is a talk I've been going around giving at a lot of institutions because it's uh, corresponding to a lot of work that's been happening during COVID times uh, by a subgroup of people. And so we're now trying to basically get more people aware and involved as to what's going on because it's kind of enabling a lot of progress. And so some of the key collaborators, really the key collaborators are, are shown in pictures here at, at, at the start. And the people in black and white are, are postdocs and they need money and grants. So if you have money, grants, jobs, give it to them. Um, and they're doing a lot of good work and the names are color coded here as to what they've been doing, okay? So I wanna get you to the point of understanding why I'm saying geometric in this title. And also I want you to understand what I mean by standard model effective field theory if you haven't had a lot of exposure to that. So I need to first get to the geometric stuff through this math. And I will do that rather quickly because I'm a little bit pressed for time. So I first wanna just explain to you and remind you of why the standard model effective field theory is a real big enterprise for theorists and experimentalists, mostly in Europe, but some in North America. And the basic reason that standard model effective field theory is being um, basically developed very rapidly and, and engaged with is because it's it's pretty much the logical response to what's happened at LHC to incorporate the information so far at LHC into uh, an effective field theory, a field theory description, which lets us now interface, interface with the data and get more out of the experimental program for its lifetime in the coming decades. So what I mean by that is that we've found, of course, a Higgs-like scalar. This is a resonance bump for the Higgs. Is there something to point with here that I should have? I'm gonna use my finger. I'm gonna use my finger. There's a resonance bump. This is two of the kind of key discovery channels for the resonance bump for the Higgs. And that's definitely there. It's a zero plus scalar. So it has properties that we can study in angular distributions and stuff, which make it look like uh, a Higgs-like scalar. And we incorporate that in our field theory description now when we actually interface with the data, that that resonance bump is there. And what we also incorporate is the information, which is a bit represented here. You can't read this, but what this is showing you just visually is, is there's a whole bunch of different models on the side. Those are like individual models on the side. And then what these bars are is exclusion bounds associated with those models. So essentially they look in the experiment in some particular final state for some kinematic feature, some bump like the Higgs bump or some other kinematic feature, they don't find it. And so then all they can do is place an exclusion bound and the stronger the bound, the more the bar is out to the side for the individual models. This is a log plot on the bottom. And the point is these colored regions are being pushed up to what's a TV scale in terms of energy, okay? And, and this is 10 TV, just to visually orient you. Okay, so basically out to about a TV, we're getting a lot of exclusions on other things we thought would be discovered along with the Higgs. So we know that this Higgs thing is in the spectrum and we know that these exclusion bounds are around. And there's for all these different models, these exclusion bounds. So down here is essentially the mass scale of electric scale states, things associated with the VEV, the Higgs, the top, the W, the Z, and even lighter things are, are further down in mass scale. But this gray shaded region is the kind of heavy states in the standard model that we know are there. And up here is where these exclusion bounds kind of crap out a little bit. They don't, they, you don't get perfect reach into this region. And so this is a rose colored region for a reason. We still hope for physics beyond the standard model to show up a loop factor above the Higgs mass, which is basically exactly in here where we're having difficulty pushing our direct search reaches. And we also have some of like the leading contenders of how we thought physics beyond the standard model would show up getting kind of experimentally constrained kind of significantly, things like SUSY. So we're trying to be open-minded now and we're trying to change the paradigm in this math from think of an individual model, get an exclusion bound, go to the next model to do something more global where we use the fact that we have these states down in this region and we have the hope for physics beyond the standard model sequestered up here in many cases. So the way we do that is we basically expand in this region compared to that region. So there's a ratio here, which is less than one. So what we do is we expand in V over M essentially. And that's something which is parametrically less than one. And that Taylor expansion, which is really what's going on, is done in a field theory sense in a consistent way. And that's an effective field theory. And that's what the standard model effective field theory is. So as I said, what's going on in terms of the SMAFT is basically a response to the experimental results. And it's then trying to take this information, build it into how we think about the experimental results going forward so that we get more out of the data in the future. And the reason this works, there's lots of technical reasons, but Basically, the reason it works is that you're then looking at local contact operator perturbations of the standard model predictions. So what I mean by local contact operator perturbations of the standard model predictions. 
So it's essentially using the fact in field theory that if you have a heavy mass scale, so something associated with that red region, some state that we think might still be there, but we haven't directly excluded it. And if we're not actually going to have an experimental probe, put it on shell, then the dependence on that mass scale because of formal results, which are known as the decoupling theorem, is controlled in our experimental predictions for the lower energy measurements that we can make and study at the collider. So essentially, you expand out the propagator, but you do it in a very controlled and formally correct way. That's the Taylor expansion. And that is leading to the effective field theory. And then you get a prediction, which is some expectation values for some observable, which would be a standard model prediction at leading order. And then the heavy mass scale associated with that red region is then sequestered in like one over heavy mass scale squared or one over heavy mass scale to the fourth. In the numerator, there can be the hard scales like the VEV, or there can be Mandel stems in the case of this two to two scattering and other more kinema other kinematics can be in other sort of event topologies. But that's the dependence on the heavy mass scale. And that's why it's local on operator contact perturbations because that's a local operator expansion. That, that is basically what's happening here. That heavy mass scale is then going to be symbolically represented by lambda in the effective field theory. And what you do is you get basically the thing called the SMAFT, which is the standard model Lagrangian at leading order. And then you get corrections with inverse powers of this heavy mass scale, or lambda in this case. So the operators, the local contact operators, for the expectation value of which give these Mandel stamps in this case, they're built out of the long distance propagating states, the things that can go on shell, and their interactions. And then the UV dependence associated with which particular UV completion of the standard model is around, if there's something we can measure, is sequestered in the Wilson coefficients of the operators and then this lambda suppression. Okay, and mostly we focus on dimension six, but now we can go beyond at dimension eight and actually learn a little bit more about what's going on in the data when we think we're studying it at dimension six, which is a lot of the point of this talk. So this is the basic idea of this map. And now I'm going to push forward a little bit into like how we think about it in a better way going forward. But if the basic idea is not clear, please ask a question now in terms of this basic setup. Don't be shy if there's anything I've said that was confusing. Okay, if we're fine, then I will go on and then push forward a little bit. Okay, so that's the basic idea, the basic setup. People are working on this. There's lots of people, hundreds of people around the world working on this. Um, and it has some challenges. So one of the reasons I want to give this talk is because we figured out how to solve some of these challenges in kind of a really kind of interesting way and in using geometry. So what are the challenges? So one of the challenges in these sorts of studies, if we want to do this thing where you go away from models into like this global effective field theory study, and we have a bunch of these operators around, is there's a lot of these operators with Wilson coefficients around. This is a count at dimension six as to what's there. And am I going out of uh, battery. Get a battery there? Okay, one sec. Let's try and do this. Okay, maybe I turned it off. Yeah, okay, am I good? Hopefully, people can hear me. Yeah. All right, so this parameter count, such as dimension six, is shown here. So, uh there's a couple of things to realize. One is that there's two lines here in the CP even and CP odd case. One is with one generation in the operators for fermion generations, and one is with three. And basically the large number of parameters that's there at dimension six, 2,499, is associated with flavor indices. And the flavor indices with the four fermion operators in particular, because you have three times three times three times three. So that's where most of the parameters come at dimension six. But nevertheless, the, there, what's listed here is all the operators. The, the, Operators above the four fermion operators, which is a, this with its eight here, they have to do with like Higgs is interacting with fermions and then just field strengths interacting with self of field strength is an X here. And then just Higgs self interactions and these sorts of things. There's much less parameters associated with them, you'll notice, irrespective of the number of fermion generations. There's, there's just a lot less. So what people are doing experimentally is, and theorists are doing, is they're basically focusing in not on the four fermion operators, they're doing measurements and they're studying some particular observables which are sensitive to tens of parameters, not you know, 2,000 parameters. But nevertheless, it's a rather important question in terms of how many more parameters come in at dimension eight compared to dimension six, just in this, the sort of observables that people are looking at now. And that's something that the geometric approach can, can address. And that's one of the challenges is like, how many parameters are there when we go to dimension eight, the next order in the expansion, when we're doing these leading order sort of studies of the data and these global fits that are happening. So it's not nearly as bad as this might make you think. You might have looked at this number, many people did, and just been like, I'm not doing this because this is impossible. We can't do a fit with that many parameters. 
but there's many reasons that the actual number of parameters that come into the experimental measurements is much less. It's not just assumption. It's not just people, you know, doing things wrong. What's happening is, is that you're interfering with the standard model and the symmetry breaking pattern of the standard model projects out a lot of the parameters. There's things like the width of the bosons in the standard model, like W and Z, the narrow widths are making it so that a lot of these parameters project out in, in realistic measurements that they do. So there's real physics that's actually there. It's not just assumptions, it's projecting out a lot of parameters, getting us down to tens of parameters in these global fits at dimension six. But it's still a problem if like it's tens of parameters at dimension six, what about dimension eight? Is it like hundreds, is it thousands? How bad is that expansion actually behaving? And that's something the geometric approach basically has solved for us and it let us learn. So that's one of the problems and we can actually, sh I'll show you a solution to that. And it's not just the number of parameters, it's also what they do, which is a bit confusing even at dimension six. And then how confusing will it be at dimension eight is a related question. So what they do is something, uh, so here's an example of what they do in terms of going from the weak to the mass eigenstate basis, okay? So you have weak eigenstate fields, you wanna to go to mass eigenstate fields. And when you actually have dimension six operators around, there's one particular Wilson coefficient here, the CHWB, so she with two field strengths, a W and a B field strength. And there's a suppressed one over lambda squared, I've absorbed it into the notation here, but it's multiplying the B squared, the CHWB, and it changes the rotation. There's a correlated shift in how it redefines the mixing angles. It shows up changing the mass. It shows up in the covariant derivative and so on and so forth. It shows up a whole bunch of different places, introducing what are barred Lagrangian parameters you'll notice. These things have bars over them. So right now, those are canonically normalized dimension six corrected Lagrangian parameters in the SMEF compared to the standard model. Uh, but they'll actually become geometric in our interpretation in a little while. But this appearance of this Wilson coefficient does a lot of correlated changes in terms of what we mean by the mass eigenstate fields and the mixing angles and the rotation from the weak to mass eigenstate. So it's like just a technical problem. How do we go from the weak to the mass eigenstates correctly in dimension eight in the cross terms of dimension six? That was something that was kind of unsolved, which also this sort of geometric thinking is going to just solve for us instantaneously once we think the right way. So the key, the reason that it's so helpful is that all the complications here are proportional to the VEV. And so we're gonna get a really good handle on the VEV physics in the operators and how it changes basically uh, our understanding of the physics when we're doing these VEV expansions, when we do this geometric thinking. So it's not just that there's a number of Lagrangian parameters, it's not just that they do some weird stuff, which is a bit confusing even at dimension six, it's that they also have to be, you know, the operator effects have to be included in when we're actually assigning numbers to our predictions to the Lagrangian parameters. So there's corrections of all sorts of corrections around. And when you're extracting things like muon decay, uh, just to get an assignment to the VEV of a number, which you want to use in predictions, if you measure it in muon decay, the VEV, then there's this correction factor, which has to do with these four fermion operators, which can sit there modifying this local contact operator in the standard model. And there's also these guys that can sit there modifying this vertex. Okay, so all of that needs to be absorbed into what you actually measure. Now, if when you made predictions, you always meant a prediction with all the, the, this physics associated with all of these sorts of corrections, there would be no effect in terms of how you made that prediction. But if you actually make other predictions, which is just dependent literally on this thing, which you want to actually assign a number to, then you have this correction factor, which is this delta GF you'll see up here. And it has to be popped out in all sorts of other places when you actually do your predictions. So it's not just the number of parameters. It's not just that they do weird stuff. It's when we assign numbers to the Lagrangian parameters, it gets a bit complicated for all the inputs and how we actually assign those numbers. And that's just at dimension six. So at dimension eight and cross terms at dimension six, it might seem intractable and impossible to actually figure out what's going on there to actually understand the next order in the expansion when we're doing leading order stuff, just to have an idea of what we're neglecting when we're doing leading order stuff. That might seem impossible, but it's actually a solved problem. For like two years, we've had this problem solved, which is why I'm giving you this talk to try and get you to understand this is a solved problem, not just at dimension eight, but at all orders in the VEV expansion. This is, this is solved. So let me show you how we've solved this. One last point is, uh, this is just another way of re-emphasizing this point. It's kind of important to know what's happening at subleading order. So what is basically coming out of theory collaborations and experimental collaborations at this stage is combined global fits of a lot of Wilson coefficients multiplying these operators, perturbing a whole bunch of measurements. So what's shown at the top there is a combination of electric precision data measurements at left with some Higgs data and some top data. And this is color coded basically by how much of the Wilson coefficients of individual Wilson coefficients appear in a particular constrained direction in the global fit. So you'll notice just two things. One is that the constraints are hierarchical. There's some things that are very constrained, some things are low constraints. This is a log plot again. And this is a suppression scale associated with constraints. So things at the top are the most constrained. And what is the most constrained? 
or the least constrained is combinations of Wilson coefficients. And this is how it works at dimension six. So again, the relevant question is, how does it change at dimension eight and dimension six squared? How does this story get affected in terms of what we think we're extracting? We think we're extracting constraints now from these global studies in this map. We really think we're learning something. How wrong are we because of the next term in the expansion? So that we have an idea of how wrong we are, how much we don't want to overinterpret the data. Okay, so can you do better? Well, you can do better in lots of different ways. And one thing that would be really great is if we could get a little bit away from these individual operators, these combinations of operators, and get a little bit more to something that was a little more basis independent because there's technical issues of having basis choices in terms of operators. So you can actually uh, get to a little bit more basis independent understanding as well with this geometric approach. This is just a preview of where we're, you're going to fully understand this in a moment. This is a preview of how it works. And so let's just think about Higgs to gamma gamma, which is something I'm a little bit obsessed with. Uh, Higgs to gamma gamma in this thinking, okay? So what do you get? And what I'll convince you of as we go forward is if you actually look at a perturbation, this is a perturbation to the standard model in Higgs to gamma gamma. So I'm looking at this vertex, the Higgs decaying to gamma gamma. That only goes through a loop in the standard model. So there's that contribution. And then let's talk about the perturbation that's due to these operator effects. So what you will find is that you get in this sort of perturbation, something which has to do with kinematics for Higgs to gamma gamma. That's a Higgs to the two gamma gamma field strengths. And then there's this thing, which is just a scaling factor. And this is actually geometric. So this is the, this is the first time I'm going to try and convince you of this. What you're actually going to find, the perturbations are actually characteristically kinematics times geometry, geometry of the field spaces that I'm going to introduce to you. And that's kind of characteristic in terms of this understanding. And what's nice is that there's not, it's not such a particular operator basis dependent thing here. This is a structure where the, where the, the uh, things I'm writing down are these kinematic structures times geometries. And these geometries will be there in any operator basis. So what this term is, this H44, is actually it's a veil bind. It's, it's basically associated with an asymptotic, uh, 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 canonically normalized Higgs uh, state. And then there's variations with respect to metrics, G33, G34, G33, G44. And then you notice again, these barred Lagrangian parameters, these E bars are around. So these are geometric uh, quantities, which I'll introduce to you in a moment. This whole thing is geometry. Geometry times kinematics is basically the way the amplitude perturbations work in the EFT. And it works at all orders. This is actually an all orders answer in the web expansion. It's not just at dimension six or dimension eight, it's at all orders in the web expansion. So let me get you to understand why this is how it actually works. This is what the GM map is around. Okay, so the reason it works this way is basically it's, it's just a careful understanding of what we actually discovered at LHC. Okay, so when I showed you this resonance bump at the start, that is something that is associated with the Lagrangian and the standard model interpretation of that. When it's that, that scalar is embedded in S2 scalar doublet, we know the standard model Lagrangian, how Higgs physics works. So there's a Lagrangian like this in the standard model. And H is this Higgs scalar doublet field, right? There's one component of that, which is the resonance bump that we see experimentally now in this interpretation of the data. And in the case of the standard model, we know how Higgs physics works, right? We basically have a vacuum expectation value of the Higgs. And then we expand around that and we go from weak to mass eigenstate fields. So you can think of that in lots of different ways. One way that's kind of nice of thinking about it, but giving mass to the other particles is that these green blobs here will be the Higgs getting a vacuum expectation value in this talk. And then when other fields are coupled to the Higgs, depending on how strongly coupled they are to the Higgs, it's like they're going through a Higgs medium. They're bumping into the Higgs when it's hitting these green blobs because they're more strongly coupled to the Higgs and they're getting a mass, they're slowing down when they're going through space. This is just kind of a heuristic way of interpreting what the Higgs is doing. And it's changing in combinations of Lagrange parameters, which are useful in weak eigenstates to combinations of Lagrange parameters, which are useful when you're thinking about mass eigenstates, but it's all proportional to the VEB. That's what the physics is that's going on. So that's what's happening. That's what we think we've discovered. And now we have that in an effective field theory uh, expansion where all these local contact operators are around. So when that's happening in the standard model, you should also remind yourself that technically what's happening when the Higgs takes on vacuum station values is endpoint functions, higher endpoint functions are descending to lower endpoint functions. So for example, the kinematic term for the Higgs, this kinetic term for the Higgs, derivatives acting on the Higgs, two derivative term on the Higgs, you can expand that out and you get two scalar fields, two Higgses, and also two vector fields, which come out of the covariant derivatives. When those two scalar fields get BEVs, green blobs again, that four point function descends to a two point function. And that gives you the mass for the vector fields, the mass of W and the mass of Z and the mass of photon. And then there's a rotation going from that to that. But interestingly and importantly, four point function descend to two point function. Higher endpoint function descends to lower endpoint function. That's what's happening in the case of the standard model. And again, with the Yukawa terms giving mass, the three point function is descending to a two point function mass 
is also pairing, again, an interesting Lagrange parameter, the mass of the fermions proportional to the VEF. So higher endpoints descend to lower endpoints when you get combinations of Lagrangian parameters that are interesting in the case of the standard model when the Higgs is around. And the exact same thing happens in the EFT. It just happens a lot more. And that a lot more happening basically forces you to do a geometric interpretation and a geometric understanding of what's going on. And that's the key point. In the case of the standard model for normalizable field theories, you can get away with just doing it directly on the page. And it's not really forcing you to do things geometrically. But once you have the infinite series around in terms of higher dimensional operators, it really becomes intrinsically geometric in a way that you'll see. So in the case of this, in, in the standard model, we talked about that for D less than or equal to four, you get masses and mass eigenstate fields, useful combinations of couplings. In the case of the EFT, you still do that, but it's happening in the context of operator perturbations. So you can write down a dimension six operator, like here at the top, that's a dimension six operator, where one of the Higgs is in that dimension six operator becomes a VAV. So you get that three point fit function again, H to gamma gamma, and there's one green blob, but that can happen at dimension six, it can also happen at dimension eight and dimension 10 and dimension 12, and it all descends down now into the same three-point function. So there's a lot more collapsing of higher endpoints to lower endpoints when you have an infinite tower of operators around in the EFT. And more importantly, what actually happens when you get this in terms of a physical perturbation is that it has to be that what actually appears in terms of the experimental measurement is independent of how you choose to write down the coordinates of the scalar field. You can choose to write down your coordinates for that four component scalar field H, one way, someone else can choose to write it down a different way. The experimental result should not depend upon that arbitrary choice a human can make. So something needs to happen, which has to do with high endpoints to set collapsing to low endpoints, and it has to be independent of the scalar field coordinatization. And it also should be something that is field redefinition variant, right? You should be able to do field redefinition variants when you're on a, basically an observable. So you should have field redefinition variants independent of the coordinate scalar field choice for the for the Higgs, and you should have something which characterizes all these higher endpoints descending and collapsing on this three-point function. So it has like a big ask, which has to satisfy all those physical principles. The thing is, is the way that you actually satisfy those constraints is you have to be describing essentially what's going on with the interactions of the scalar fields, which is defining a field space. It has to be describing that physics in a way that is independent of the scalar coordinate field choice. And if you have a, 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 if you have a space, and you want to describe a property of a space that's independent of how someone chooses the coordinates, like physical space, you know, polar coordinates versus the Cartesian coordinates, properties of that space which are independent of the choice that a person could make on the coordinates is the things like topological properties of that space. Things like curvature of the space are what is actually the things that are independent of the coordinates. So we introduce geometric concepts and geometric ideas. So there should be a geometry associated with the interaction terms in the scalar fields which will basically capture this physics. That's why it has to be fundamentally geometric once you have this infinite tower of operators around. It has to satisfy these physical principles of how it's perturbing the amplitude. So it has to be fundamentally geometric. And what happens essentially is that you get geometries. And through those geometries, you get masses and mass eigenstate fields and useful combinations of Lagrangian parameters again, just like in the case of the standard model. But it goes through a series of geometries. And that's why I was showing you with Higgs to gamma gamma that exactly happening in that kind of motivation slide uh, uh, just a second ago. So let me show you this in more math now that you have kind of the concept in mind as to why it has to work this way. So this, I'm now going to define these objects for you. They're going to be color coded now going forward because there's actually more than one geometric space around. That's why there was an S in the, in the title of the talk. Uh, these are geometric dressings, and that's going to multiply kinematic structure for Higgs to gamma gamma. Okay. So the first field space of this form that people understood was essentially this one, which is associated again with the kinetic term for the Higgs. Okay. So if you take the scalar uh, term for the Higgs, the, 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 uh, the kinetic term, and you open the indices i and j, i and j run from one to four now, and h is going to be just written in terms of real scalar field coordinates, you could ask yourself the question in field theory, can I just take a basic, uh, an object with two indices, h, i, j, as a function of scalar fields, and multiply that by the kinetic term. And can I do field theory like that? Can I do field theory with an uncanonically normalized kinetic term for a Higgs? The answer is yes. People were asking that question even back in the 80s. And this uh, Russian was actually asking this back in the 80s. And it can be done. And what you have basically done is you start to think about these kinetic terms as interaction terms in defining a field space. Okay, And then this is a metric on a field space, which is associated with a distant measure on that space. And from that metric, you can actually do things like derive Riemann curvature tensors, which is like this Rijk here, 
can we derive from this in just the standard way in GR? And this is a meaningful object that appears in scattering amplitudes. And it's not zero. There's curvature in the space once you have Wilson coefficients around, once you have the higher dimensional operator perturbations to the standard model. So if you take the square root of this metric and the expectation value, the ones on the diagonal are the flat field space limit of the standard model. This tilde is there for the Wilson coefficients because we're taking expectation value of h dagger h over lambda squared times Wilson coefficient. And these perturbations introduce the curvature. And you go to the case of the standard model, this again is the square root of the metric, it's just one the diagonal and it's just a flat field space. So we're normalizable field theories you should start to associate with flat field spaces, flat interaction field spaces. And when you have these higher dimensional operator perturbations around, you get curvature associated with these field spaces. And these are the things that actually make the geometries non-trivial because they project onto amplitudes and actually show up in physical observables. So are there any questions so far in terms of what I'm introducing? Because there's a lot of concepts being layered one after the other. Yes. So uh, I understand that the you're trying to did everything based on standard model. But uh, we know like a new team of exists and mm -hmm. they expand the standard model into uh, a couple of left tracks. Sure. And do I need to do this geometry uh, again again for that new team? So if you were to, so we have neutrino masses here just in a dimension five operator, the Weinberg operator is around. If you wanted to do, so I'm telling you about how this physics works in an effective field theory when you have this hard dimensional operators around. The message I'm trying to give to you is that this is an understanding of field theory, which has become clear from doing effective field theories and that you will profit and can profit when you even apply to other situations, other models, which have more complicated um, sort of field content than the standard model. So this breaking down of an amplitude perturbation and being kinematics times geometric structures and field space dictated by the Lagrangian interaction terms is a very general message I'm sending to you. And you can think of this in many other contexts as well, and you can apply it elsewhere. You don't get much uh, benefit when you're doing renormalizable models. And the reason is renormalizable models, generally speaking, because of the mass dimension of the fields themselves, are associated with flat field spaces. So it projects out kind of onto these ones, in the case of the standard model, it happens in other models as well. It projects out this kind of structure of the field theory that's actually there and it's kind of clear once you actually do the general sort of field theory case and have a higher dimensional operator expansion around. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so. Uh, yeah. Actually, I'm trying to get to the point, like suppose I have multiple fields, mm -hmm. which are arising with the, the um, from additional Symmetry. How would this so if that symmetry breaking some other scale associated with the symmetry breaking is at a high enough scale that we're not going to resolve it experimentally, it would project onto the EFT, obviously. If you get that the only these but sure. suppose I get some additional operators. Sure, you can always add other field content. I mean, I this is the standard model EFT, this is what I'm yes, basically building right. geometry on. If you add other field content, if you have other long distance propagating states, yes, you need to incorporate those other long distance propagating states into the operator forms themselves. If it's an EFT in that case as well, you will still profit from doing a geometric construction because you'll see it'll let you solve things at all orders in any web expansion, anything associated with a hard scale, so you can associate with scalar symmetry, like expectation value of scalars, you will see is actually going to be something that you can resum and get all orders answers out of very simply. And that's a generic sort of thing that happens as well. Because of the fact that the scalar fields, if it's not just single scalar fields with single degree of freedom, have to go through coordinate invariant structures for the scalar. So that, that it has to be geometric. And it's a general lesson, which is independent of the standard model, but it's clear now in the case of the standard model and the standard model EFT extension of it. So there was another question. We can come back, but is it, yes, you have another? Yeah, if you go back to your H again again example. Yeah. You can see it a lot. <laughs> yeah. So well, it's actually difficult for me. Yeah, so this I one. Assume, I would assume that okay, there's this kinematic factor times geometry. Mm -hmm. I would assume the kinematic factor is known, and then when you go and measure this amplitude, we would then constrain the sum of geometric factors. That's right. Does that mean that there's like a degeneracy? In the, in That's the why method? you need to combine measurements, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you still need to combine measurements, but you're getting closer to things that are the actual amplitude perturbation. Okay. Because these geometries appear in different ways in different measurements, as you'll see. Okay. So, so common geometries are project. So we, the way you should think of experimental measurements is it's going to be the intersection of multiple field spaces 
with particular projections. And that's what defines a particular measurement. And if you project intersections of field spaces enough, eventually you can characterize them completely and break the degeneracies. Right. Okay. So another yeah. uh, type of amplitude would give me another sum. Yes, I'll, I'll show you some. Take yeah. the okay. That's right. That's why it works to break degeneracies when it's the operator representation of the expansion of the geometries. And it also can work if you think of these as just general objects that are there in the amplitude. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. So I guess you know, I could you please repeat the, uh, the question for the, uh, the Zoom? Oh, right. I will, uh, going forward, I will do that. <laughs> I, know, sir, I have a very nice question. Uh, yeah. So maybe I missed something in, in your talk, but the, uh, so here the, the metric uh, mm -hmm. is, you know, the four by four, given uh, by four by four metrics. Uh, is this only a back center or some, uh, is, it on the, is there a, some underlying reason uh, to have the four by four metric here? Oh, okay. So your question was, is why is this HIJ, the square root of this metric here, why is it a four by four matrix? In this case, it's because the four scalar field coordinates. Remember, a Higgs has four field coordinates. We're parameterizing the Higgs in a real scalar field coordinates, phi, one, two, three, four. And that's why this is a matrix, which is four by four. That's why H has I and J indices, which run from one to four. Okay. So this is the first field space, and it'll be characterized with like pink going forward whenever it shows up or variations of it show up. Okay. Now, here's another one. There's not just one field space. The, this one we also realized was around a couple of years ago when we had to do gauge fixing. So what this is, is this is the field space, which is now gonna be with open indices A and B, which again run from one to four, multiplying a generalized Yang-Mills term. So this W, A, and W, B, the W runs from one, two, three for the Ws and then B. So we've absorbed the B field in there. It's a generalized Yang-Mills term. It'll be characterized in yellow, in this talk going forward. It's again a four by four, but in this case, because of these four field coordinates, one, W, one to three, and then B. And when you have higher dimensional operators in a particular operator basis, just like in the case of the Higgs uh, kinetic term, you will have particular perturbations to the ones in the diagonal, which are the flat field space limit of the standard model. These uh, guys with tildes again, are just particular operators in a particular operator basis, perturbing the flat field space limit of the standard model. This is a different metric. You can calculate its Riemann curvature tensor, and it's also curved, it's not zero. And the perturbations are what leads to this being a curved field space. Okay, so this is another geometric structure that's around. So those two are around. And with just those two in our hands, if we, if we just treat them as general objects, okay, so if we stand back from the operator representation of those two things I've introduced, the G and the H metrics, and I just asked myself the question, can I do a consistent transformation from the weak eigenstates to the mass eigenstates? And just can I do that in principle, where I have a real well-defined generator associated with the asymptotic states in both cases, you can do that transformation. And if you solve that transformation in a consistent fashion, you find these constraints in terms of how you introduce these Lagrangian parameters, the ones that were barred before, which were simply the canonically normalized dimension six corrected Lagrangian parameters, are now going to be the things that show up in a consistent transformation from the weak to the mass eigenstate basis. So you'll notice there's just one that's like the coupling for you know the SU2 group. There's one that's the effective coupling of the Z. There's one that has to do with the, the electric charge. There's the masses themselves. And then there's two mixing angles, which is actually a thing that shows up when you do this. You realize that there's two mixing angles around. In the case of the standard model, those are degenerate. When you have dimension six perturbations, it's still degenerate. But if you just look at the math and do consistency at all orders, you find that there's actually two you need to introduce to do that transformation from the weak to the mass eigenstate basis. And in here, we're just writing it in terms of these general entries. If we knew them, then we would have all orders answers for these Lagrangian parameters on our hands, which we could then expand it in a particular operator basis. Here, we've just done something consistency, transforming the math from one basis to another basis, one field basis to another field basis. And we actually do have these, uh, these guys, which are highlighted at all orders from, because of another piece of physics. We actually know those as well. So the reason we know those is because of a nice feature, because we're doing scalar dressings of kinematic structures in the field theory. So when you have scalars around and you have just an SUN fundamental, the scalar in this case, SU2 fundamental, and you have it and its possible symmetry generators. So you have basically Higgs's contracted with Higgs's in terms of indices. Higgs is possibly contracted with basically the poly matrix. <laughs> Uh, those are your options in terms of how you can dress your kinematics, then essentially you run out of the possibility of doing independent different contractions very quickly because of the completeness relations of SUN field theory and SUN just gauge symmetry representations, right? So there's like a reduction in terms of the poly matrix times the poly matrix in terms of delta functions. And 
In this case, what that means is that once you go to basically dimension eight, you basically run out of other sorts of contractions you can do in terms of writing down this dressing of some particular kinematic structure, this H and this G. So these are all orders infinite series expansions. And what is an infinite series of here is basically that there's essentially phi squared at some point appears. So essentially you run out of independent ways to do contractions. And then when you want to go to higher mass dimensions, you just write down H dagger H times what you already wrote down at some lower order. And so you can get an all orders answer. These are equal signs. And these gammas here are not um, Christoffel symbols. They are basically a way of representing the symmetry generators in this real field space representation for the scalar fields. But these are all orders answers for these two objects. Now, these basically are written down because of the completeness relations. They're, they're, just, they're just the closed form answers that you can find. And then because we have these and we have what we had on the previous slide, we actually have a lot of power on our hands already. So when we do two and three point functions, we can basically get all orders answers in the VEV expansion. It automatically resummed it for us because we could write these things down. And that's very powerful because it does things like Higgs to gamma gamma at all orders in closed form from the sort of expression that I showed you at the start. So it's like an example of the benefit of this approach which just falls into your lap doing it this way. It's just because a lot of different pieces of physics combine to basically help you solve the theory in the expansion parameter, the VEV over the cutoff scale. So it's kind of nice. And it cleans up some confusion. So now we want to go from weak to mass science. I told you we did this in a self-consistent way with generators. And now you can understand what's going on in the standard model and then how it generalizes in the EFT at all orders. In the case of the standard model, we had ones on the diagonal, remember, for those field space objects. It was a flat field space limit. And you just had a rotation going from the weak to the mass eigenstate basis. And that's what you learn in your textbooks in the case of the standard model. That's flat because it's a, the field space, because you're le less than D, less than or equal to four. It's kind of an accidental flatness. But it's just a rotation going from the weak to the mass eigenstate basis. And it's quite straightforward. And when you actually do the EFT, and you actually have this understanding of the field spaces around, these curved field spaces around, what you actually write down generalizing is just you take the ones that were on the diagonal and you just basically go to the square root of the metric, which is the veil bind, which is defining the asymptotically canonically normalized states. And then these are the unique things you would write down in the transformation at all orders in the expansion parameter in v squared over lambda squared. So it just solves it for you instantaneously how to do that. And that you know is something that's a bit non trivial once you go to higher orders, how to do with the off terms on the matrices, but just tells you how to do it in a consistent fashion. And it's actually the nice because it's basically. You, you basically can't write anything else down. It's just basically you're just doing the index contractions correctly, and then you just get the answer. That's the right answer, which confused a lot of people for a lot of years as to how to go beyond dimension six to do this. But it just solves it, and then you just know it. So it's kind of a nice thing that it just does for you. And it also helps you understand this, which was a bit weird, what was going on at dimension six alone in terms of this transformation from the weak to the mass eigenstate basis and how those Lagrange parameters are being changed. So What's highlighted here is just what's coming from these metrics. That's why there's all this replicated structure from particular Wilson coefficients coming around. So what's actually been happening here is that transformation, which you saw just on the previous slide, which is very simple and dictated by just index contractions, that is basically telling you that when you wrote things down this way and expanded out to dimension six, you're basically taking curved field space structures and then expanding them out and like linearizing them to leading order in an expansion parameter. And when you were doing that, that's why you had this correlated appearance of the Wilson coefficient. So very much what was happening here was you had a structure which was curved, and you have a way to do the field space coordinates, which basically understands it's curved. And then if you expand into something which is like flat field space limit, a Cartesian limit, then you have a curved space and you're projecting it onto Cartesian coordinates. And so you get correlated transformations, projections onto those flat field space limits, those, those uh, orthogonal Cartesian coordinate systems. And that's essentially what's happened here. That's why you're having this correlated transformation, correlated projection involving this Wilson coefficient. It's, you've taken something which are intrinsically Lagrangian parameters, which have to do with characterizing things in curved field spaces and projected them onto things that were like in the standard model, which were like these flat field space limits. Okay, that's exactly why the structure is appearing in this correlated way. So it lets you understand how this works. And it basically solves this, not just at dimension six, it solves it at all orders. You just take the closed form answer and just expand and you have the answer to any order of dimension that you want. So that's a real benefit. So it should be clear at this stage as to how we're reformulating the field theory. We're basically taking this thing, which was this Lagrangian, which had implicitly an assumption of basically doing the bottom up, the SMAFT approach, which actually also was basically taking those curved field spaces and kind of trivializing them away in our thinking, projecting onto like a, a coordinate system, which was flat. And we're reorganizing things now into basically pull out the kinematic factors, and then isolate as much as possible the geometric dressings which are associated with the scalar fields. And that reorganization, it's the same theory, 
But that reorganization is very powerful because it's actually capturing more what's actually going on in the physics and how it appears in the amplitudes. So we want to just do this systematically going forward. And that's what we've done in terms of the geometric snap. Okay. So I talked a lot about these two highlighted, GAB and, and HIJ. The other ones that we need to know to do two and three point interactions for CP even terms um, is just listed here. It's actually a non-trivial statement of math that you don't actually need to know a large number of these sort of field space connections. There's actually not that many that you need to know. There's another one that has to do with derivatives acting on scalars and then interacting with the field strength. There's the three field strength interaction terms, the ones that we talked about. Then there's just the potential. And then there's basically uh, the generalization of the Ukawa, the dipole operator, and then anomalous couplings of Ws and Zs to fermion pairs. And then the equivalent for the gluon fields. But that's it. If we knew all of those at all orders, we could do a ton of phenomenology at all orders in the VEV expansion, the tree level, and just expand. And then we could understand what's happening in dimension six and also dimension eight. And we knew all these things for like two years, which is why I'm telling you about this. <laughs> so we know this. Now this, there's a non-trivial math here in terms of why there's a minimal set of those terms. That's non-trivial. I don't want to get into it in this talk, but we can discuss it later. If you're doing derivative reduction in the field theory and also in the field space connections to get down to that minimal set. Something you know, non-trivial happened in math, but it's just a choice which makes it this, that this is the physics that's clear. And that's basically the standard choice in EFT of removing derivative terms if you can, because it's basically imposing the equation of motion early in the calculation. And when you do that, you get this sort of benefit. So you start to see what I've been telling you in words. If you look at what's happening here, what is the top two? Those were these uh, guys that I showed you all orders answers for. And what is counting here is basically at dimension six and dimension eight, dimension 10, dimension 12, how many independent terms there are in those structures. There's only two independent terms at dimension six for this dressing for the kinetic term for the Higgs. There was three for the one that was the Yang-Mills generalized term. At dimension eight, you get one more in the generalized Yang-Mills term. You don't get any new ones in terms of the Higgs kinetic term. And at dimension 10, it's saturated. It just is H dagger H towers on top of that. And that's quite characteristic as to how these things work because of the completeness relations. You basically learn essentially all the structure for the dressings of these kinematic terms out to dimension eight. And then on top of that, it's just H dagger H towers. So that actually gives you a lot of power in terms of doing things at all orders in the VEV expansion if you understand it this way. So these guys also do things which are kind of in interesting to interpret and understand. The leading one you saw gave the W and Z mass. The next one gave couplings and mixing angles at all orders. Then there's just anomalous couplings, Ukawas, dipoles, and then anomalous couplings of Ws and Zs to fermions. So I'm a little pressed for time. So let me just try and get across to you one of the things you can do with this technology on your hands in terms of all orders understanding and doing dimension eight things like electric precision data. And I'll kind of stop. <clears throat> so this, this, this is just visually representing something I've told you. So on the previous slide, let me just go back for a sec. Things are color coded. And then on this slide, what it's showing you is basically how the general number of parameters that appear in the CFT, which grows exponentially as a function of the mass dimension. So dimension six, there was the 2,499. It's actually 3,045 here because you added baryon number violating operator parameters in. This growth here on a log plot is a line. So it's an exponential number of parameters in general. That's the Hilbert series. It's been telling us this. That's what these papers are about. These constant lines at the bottom are the ones which are just basically essentially you get complexity up to dimension eight, and then it's just H dagger H towers on top of that, not more parameters appearing in those structures as you go up in operator mass dimension. So if you have a theory which has an infinite, you know, an exponential number of parameters, and a subset of those, which is the most interesting phenomenology, is associated with this hidden simplistic structure, which you can pull out doing geometric thinking, it's good to understand the geometry is there because it basically lets us pull out. The subset of parameters that's under control from the general theory structure, which is growing in this, you know, uh, way that has an exponential involved in terms of the number of parameters, and that actually projects into the experimental measurements that we'll do. So there's no free lunch if you want to go with the derivative expansion, which is essentially associated with going to higher energies. If you go with the VEV expansion, which is the one I've been resumming, you have a limited number of parameters that is going to project onto the experimental measurements. We can understand really well what's happening in terms of the measurements at LHC and combined with left data, even at subleading order or higher orders in the EFT. Whereas other sort of measurements that basically live off of this exponential growth in number of parameters, it's, there's a very different, big difference in terms of how we can learn from those experimental measurements. So let me just try and get across to you how this helps us do things like electric precision data out to dimension eight. So 
this thinking basically says if we could understand this vertex in a generalized way on the Higgs medium with all of these green blobs, then we would have this thing at dimension six and dimension eight, dimension 10, dimension 12. So what do we need? We need basically the kinetic term for the Higgs in this generalized geometric understanding. I've shown you all the components of that already in this talk. And then we need to add to that possible field space connections that have to do with extra scalar fields and fermion bilinears. So if we knew these objects and that, we could add them together and do electric precision data, dimension eight or dimension 10. And we do know all those objects for two years. So when we expand them out and combine them, it's a very simple one line answer as all orders in the V over lambda expansion for that anomalous coupling for the W and Z and the photon to fermion pairs. It's just this. And this is the field space connection that feeds in. And then this is just the canonically normalized asymptotic states associated with the, the, the vectors. So you expand it out. You get something that looks more like what you're used to in the standard model for the coupling of the W, the Z, and the photon. And you get these field space connection objects, perturbing things. But we know that, so we can just do it. So we can go through to k-widths. We can just calculate electric precision data if we so wish for LEP and interpret LEP data at dimension 6 or dimension 8 systematically. So we now have an understanding of this vertex, which is a leading standard model piece. And we've generalized it onto these curved field spaces, so we know this infinite series. So we know the dimension six perturbations, we know the dimension eight perturbations and dimension six cross terms as well. So the way I'm just representing this information to you, this is just a, a chart, which basically is telling you what this dimension six perturbation is. So this effective coupling at dimension six is this individual number, one of these numbers times one of these Wilson coefficients plus the next one down times the Wilson coefficient and so on and so forth, plus this number times this Wilson coefficient. That's just how I'm showing you the information. There's two numbers here because this is two different input parameter schemes. We know the answer in both input parameter schemes. And this just tells you these anomalous couplings to dimension six as the numerical coefficients in terms of the projection onto the dimension six perturbations. And now we know as well, the dimension six squared stuff, the cross terms, we know all of that. And we know the dimension eight stuff, which people didn't know before, but you know, 20 years, people didn't calculate this. And then once we had this technology on our hands, it calculated like itself in a couple of weeks. Okay, so it's really powerful stuff. And this is again, just a representation of the numbers times the perturbations. This is just the information that's there, which is needed to study the data out to dimension eight. So it shows you a couple of things. There's a lot of cross terms. It's not just the sub the square of the dimension six itself. There's a lot of individual cross term structure as you would expect. And there's not that many things to do with dimension eight. There's a couple of, of new things at dimension eight, but not that many, which is consistent with what I was telling you before. There's not that much new structure once you go up in the mass dimension for these particular measurements projected onto these low endpoints. So if you actually look at what this happens, what happens in terms of interpreting the data, this is as a function of the cutoff scale, how a perturbation can come in. So you choose some individual Wilson coefficients for a dimension six perturbation. You look at the dimension six perturbation, which is a line here. The dimension six squared, simple square one, which is the other line, which is black. And then the shaded region is when you vary over all the other stuff. So basically what you're asking yourself is, if you think you learned about a perturbation, how wrong were you in what you thought you learned when you have these other parameters around which you can now calculate and just vary them around to see how much they could perturb your, what you thought you understood from the data. And it's not that bad at the end of the day for this particular coupling of Z to leptons. This is not that bad in terms of how it's perturbing what, you're, what you think you're knowing. And it, as you go up with the cutoff scale of the theory, converges that you actually have not been screwed up by these other operator effects of dimension eight around, as you would expect, just because they get smaller. But that's not the whole story. If you actually do in detail how electric precision data works, you get this sort of information. Okay, so let me just walk you through this a little bit. So what's being shown here on the left is two individual Wilson coefficients that are associated with the S and T parameter. And then the red region and then the shaded region is basically what you would get if you thought you learned from the data when you had one TV in terms of your cutoff scale. And then you, when you had two TV in terms of your cutoff scale, well, you thought you would learn at dimension six. And then when you go to dimension eight consistently with those parameters, getting the cross terms and then the squared terms. And you see it shifts quite a bit once you're down in cutoff scale, what you thought you learned versus what actually is the, the way that the fit is being pulled by those parameters being round. And when you go to two TV, things kind of converge. So again, <clears throat> Once you go to higher cutoff scales, these dimension eight and cross terms of dimension six effects start to damp out as they should. Things are not completely out of control. But there are things about electric precision data 
where you think you're learning a lot because of accents in the standard model, like the forward backward asymmetry of the leptons, because the lepton vectorial coupling is almost zero because of the Weinberg angle being the numerical value it is, you get what you think are a lot of constraints coming out of that particular measurement. But it's also very sensitive to the subleading terms because of that numerical accident that's happening in the case of the standard model. So this is just a variation of sampling the dimension eight terms and seeing how much it affects compared to the standard model, the shift in terms of what you thought you got. So it's causing quite a disturbance in terms of what you think you're learning when you actually have that variation around. And it's very scheme dependent because you're, you're dealing with something which is a numerical cancellation with the input parameter scheme, which is the alpha scheme versus the one which is the MW scheme, two different ways you can assign numerical values to Lagrangian parameters. It's very scheme dependent how much this is affecting things. So this tells you a number of things. One is electrocution data is affected by these effects a lot more than people think. So when we combine it in with Higgs data, we should be very careful about this sort of thing and assigning errors associated with neglecting this stuff. It's very scheme dependent in terms of the input parameter scheme as well. So we should definitely, when we conclude and decide what future collider we're gonna build, do more than one input parameter scheme so that we don't you know, make a scheme dependent choice for $40 billion. So this is gonna really affect significant things about future collider studies. People should be taking this into account in these very important studies and they're currently not. So going back to Higgs to gamma gamma, I'm going to gloss over this because I'm basically uh, running out of time. You saw this a lot. So what I'm going to show you is just the equivalent of how that one plot worked for Higgs for the Z to fermion pairs when I had uh, basically the effect of the subleading terms being varied over. So remember, the Z coupling to fermion pairs is tree level in the standard model. It's just there. Whereas Higgs to gamma gamma, you have to go through a loop. Now, because you're going through a loop in the case of the standard model, there's a very big difference in terms of how these subleading effects uh, uh, cause you have difficulties interpreting the data. And I'll just show it to you as a visual representation. It's this, okay? So it's like what we were doing for Z to Fermion pairs. We're choosing values of Wilson coefficients. We're not doing any fancy, tricky choices. We're just randomly choosing some. And those two lines are what the dimension six perturbation you thought it would be. And then the dimension six square perturbation you thought it would be. And the shaded region is what happens when you vary over all the other stuff we can calculate now and say how much did it screw up our interpretation of the data. It's a big effect and it's characteristic of loop processes in the standard model that you're having such a big perturbation. So the fact that we thought we could learn the most from loop processes in the standard model with operator perturbations has a cost, which is the subleading terms have a bigger effect on how we interpret the data. That's essentially what's going on. Okay. So this really matters because when we have LHC, we have two loop processes, which are the key things for studying the Higgs. Glue glue Higgs and Higgs to gamma gamma. And they both are very sensitive to these higher order effects, which we can now calculate with these geometric approaches, which people couldn't calculate before. So we got to deal with this because if we just assign errors associated with neglecting this stuff in a naive way, it'll completely disable the experimental program in these EFT studies. Right now, what they're doing when they do these global fits is they just ignore this stuff. So obviously it's gonna change the conclusions and we wanna basically characterize an error in a way that's sensible. Otherwise, we're just gonna disable this EFT program at LHC. So that would be bad. So I don't have much time. I just wanted to show you one thing related to someone else's question, your question. This is an example in terms of Higgs to ZZ and Higgs to WW, how the metrics appear in another uh, off-shell observable in this case, that, that vertex. It's not the full answer, but it builds up to the full answer, which you can describe geometrically for Higgs to four leptons, which is very important experimentally. And you'll see what is appearing here is different combinations of those metrics. So that's how you break the degeneracies. But it's the same base geometric structures that are appearing in multiple observables. And we have them under control, so we can actually do these experimental studies in a controlled way, looking at the subleading terms and how they're affecting our conclusions. And it's not all degenerate. Okay, so that's just Higgs to gamma gamma, Higgs to ZZ and Higgs to WW, it's also happening. Let me skip over this. Okay, so I don't have much time left. We started a bit late. Let me just make a, a, a one kind of cool point to you. Okay, so how we actually got convinced that this is the way that the theory actually works. So if this was really the structure of the field theory, it should not be something I kept saying in, in when I was talking about these metrics and how they can affect perturbations and how they can describe things at dimension six and dimension eight, a tree level understanding, right? You could be like, oh, well, it's just some way of basically rewriting the physics. It looks kind of nice at tree level, but if it doesn't work in loops, it's not really an understanding which is there in the field theory. It's just some trickery you figured out with variables or something. 
but it does work in the loops. In fact, the loops is how we found it in the first place. <laughs> That's why it's kind of important. So why is it working in the loops as well? And how do we find it essentially? So the issue was that we wanted to basically try and do loop calculations involving these higher dimensional operators. And when we did some like brute force calculations without any of this geometric understanding, we got a bunch of structure, which was difficult to understand because of how the word identities were appearing to be modified. The word identities are symmetry statements of the field theory. You write down operators that preserve the symmetry, and yet the word identities are changing. So what the heck is going on? It's confusing. And so what we wanted to do to fix this problem or understand what was going on more correctly was to basically do the nice gauge fixing, which is the gauge fix on a background field, do essentially what Tuft had done in the 70s, build a gauge fixing parameter which involved the higher dimensional operators, and then basically study the ward identities of the theory to see what's going on. So if you want to write down this gauge fixing term on these background Higgs manifolds, it's actually a beautiful thing that has been figured out as terms of how we actually do that. What Tuff did was basically he just squared this term. So there was a flat field space. Remember the ones in the diagonal. It was just a simple square with one XC parameter. And what we did essentially to understand how this stuff works with operators around is you basically pull apart that naive square and you do the contraction in the curved field space it's very easy to understand you're taking the gauge fixing from a flat field space onto the curved field space that's actually there and when you do that you write down a unique gauge fixing term where this other metric also appears this is the gauge fixing parameter or the xc parameter and this is the gauge fixing term you write down that is actually unique it's dictated by the index structure just you basically take everything that was a square and you pull it apart and put the metrics there. It's really simple, right? And that's just generalizing this, this onto the curve field spaces that are actually there physically. And what comes out of that is a direct understanding of why the word identities were being changed, which is what convinced us the theory is geometric. So if you do the background field method, it's really nice because then you take a variation with respect to the gauge parameter, the background field transformation. It's background field independent by construction, this gauge fixing approach doesn't screw up the symmetries. So you know that you take the variation of the effective action, it's zero. And then from that, you derive what are the ward identities in the background field method. And exactly what happens is really nice. What pops out of it is, if you start to look at the two-point function identities, the appearance of the operators, which was confusing the crap out of us and other people, is understood to be that what was the Z mass in the case of the standard model, which was the flat field space limit of the standard model, is exactly generalized onto the curved field space limit of the Z mass. It's the bar parameter. And that's a non-trivial thing that happens in the math that combines up. Okay, so what it tells you is the ward identities that you get are ward identities relating curved field space Lagrangian parameters. And then you understand why the ward identities are being changed. It all makes sense again. And the theory makes sense. And it cleans up the perturbative calculations. It lets you do cross-checks in the perturbative calculations so you understand what's actually going on. And it simplifies what you get in terms of the answer. So that's basically actually how we found it. It wasn't the dimension eight stuff. This is how we found it. So it doesn't just work at tree level. At loop level, this stuff works too. It's actually the structure that's there in the field theory, which is why I'm kind of passionately trying to tell you about it. <laughs> so, and it's non-trivial. Okay, so we checked this not just as like a, 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 a derivation in the word identities. We did the one loop calculation to check. And if you look at that paper, I did this paper with Tyler Corbett, uh, who's a postdoc of mine currently, it's awesome how it works. If you look at how things combine up to actually make this happen at one loop, it's 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 great. It's really, really nice. I mean, you basically have a perturbation in the case of the standard model two-point function. You have the consistent change of the Z mass that comes in. And the two-point functions, it's really complicated how everything combines up to give exactly the, the one loop preservation of the word identity. It's a beautiful thing. And it, it really tells you that the theory is fundamentally geometric in structure. I don't have time for this, so I'm going to skip it. And that's really important. I'm just going to make one statement on this and I'm done. So our ability to calculate has now been significantly improved by this geometric approach. So now we can take, take things like Higgs to gamma gamma and glue glue Higgs. And for the first time, we can calculate up to dimension eight consistently and you know dimension six squared consistently. And we can add that to the loop calculation, which is also consistent. And we can consistently formulate because of what I just showed you in terms of the background field calculation. And then we can get results like this, which is the perturbation of glue glue Higgs compared to the standard model with everything consistent out to dimension eight and also with the loops of dimension six consistent. And they're cross consistent. They actually know about each other. These are not independent expansions, which is actually something else that comes out of this. But that answer is now known. And then we can look at that answer and we can say, well, we're going to interpret the data. And what the experimentalists are doing is they want to look at the leading term and neglect all that other stuff. 
And how bad is it to neglect all other stuff? Now that we can calculate it, we can actually answer that question. And if we just do a naive assignment of the error or varying things around like this, you get into deep trouble because it basically introduces a large error, which is basically bigger than their experimental error already. But when we have this sort of answer on our hands, we can actually look in detail of like, well, how bad is it to basically do something which is actually inconsistent in the field theory is to go to subleading order and project onto essentially a geometric structure and then look at the field redefinition induced ambiguities that are resulting from doing something inconsistent in the power counting, including a subset of dimension eight terms. How bad is that can be actually answered because we actually know the answer. And if you do that and look at that, this is a paper I wrote this fall with Adam Martin, you can look at the subleading numerical ambiguities that are introduced to doing that. And it actually damp damps down the error to be smaller than the current experimental error. So even though it's formally inconsistent in the power cutting of the field theory, it goes in the direction of projecting onto these geometric structures. And then the errors induced in that approach is much smaller than it is the current experimental error. So this is the way the experimentalists have to go to interpret their data and keep benefiting from the statistics improving. This is what they're actually thinking about now. So that's just a point, which is what this stuff lets you do. It lets you fix these sorts of problems, which are key problems at LHC. And that's it. Sorry, I went over time slightly. I just wanted to basically tell you about this and I'm going around telling everyone about this because this is a true sentence. This is a very important true sentence. Okay. Higgs physics is the physics of curved field spaces. Now, who would have thought that was the case? But it's actually the case. And when you understand that's the case, it lets you do all sorts of calculations you can't do. And it makes things that were impossible before easy. So it's just a really good approach to this sort of physics. And it's a message that I hope you take on and you can do these sorts of calculations too in, in a very short time scale. So that's all I have to say. Okay, so thank you so much for a uh, very nice and interesting talk. Uh, so questions for Mike? More questions? Yeah. Yeah, so can I follow up again about my generative question? Um, if I want to study like an extended Higgs vector, if like bigger, like a bigger Higgs multiplex, then yep. the four dimensional one. Yeah, this will still work. In fact, it'll be, I mean, the, it, you know, go on. Let me finish your question. Yeah, I think you know my question. Basically, yeah. like, uh, do I have to worry as much about the generative piece, or can I be sure that there's enough observables to go around to kind of um, completely determine the geometric factors? In my I think you're going to be fine because it, so, well, it's a question of when you're thinking about this bigger Higgs multiplet, if there's going to be other gold zones around. And I think the answer has to be no, otherwise it's already ruled out, essentially, right? So you're going to be like this other heavy vectors absorbing gold stones around, and they're going to be integrated out. So you're going to, at the, because of that, if that is true under your scenario, which I think it has to be for it to be interesting phenomenologically, it will project down this higher multiplet onto low endpoint functions in a way that's the same. Okay. And then it, it'll, it'll be, it, the generalities will be broken for that reason. So I can just kind of repackage it in terms of yeah. In fact, when you go to more, so if, so that's kind of an interesting subtle point. Uh, scalars, if there's one degree of freedom in a scalar, there's no curvature because there's no way to basically change the coordinates of that scalar that's weird and that needs to be captured by some geometric understanding of that scalar field space, right? Because it's just one degree of freedom, there's nothing there. For you to have geom geometric structure of scalar field spaces, you need to have more degrees of freedom than one in a scalar. But as you go to more and more scalar fields, it becomes more and more kind of essential to the physics that that's what's going on, that coordinate invariance you want. People get into a lot of confusion in two Higgs doublet models, poorly named things, but two Higgs doublet models, which have more and more degrees of freedom, they get a lot of confusion on their hands as to what's the physical observables, which can also be cleaned up by this geometric understanding. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Might be a question on Zoom. I don't know. Yes, uh, maybe. Yeah. So, question from our uh, Zoom audience. If they could hear me, I hope they could hear me. Is this on? I have a question. Oh yeah. If you add supersymmetry in your construction, mm -hmm. did you have uh, did, did you have any constraints on that or? So. Um, you can do this for supersymmetry as well. Um, so when you say add supersymmetry to discussion, add any constraints, you have to be more specific as to what you're asking. Mm -hmm. um, but, but let me just say the following. Let's, let's be more specific. So okay. you have 
the thing that basically reduced the geometry you can simplify things that's yeah the it's the proven claim yeah okay. and then now if you want to have supersymmetry mm -hmm. and you you have to have a pair of space time then you would have to deal with super gravity sure yep as the background manifold yep and the super gravity uh, things are very very constrained sure so you have maximum 11 you know uh, yeah but are you going to be doing the are you going to be doing supergravity which is interesting which has scale separation involved and then will be projected onto an effective field theory of some form because yes. it's not already ruled out then you'll have an infinite tower around and the physics story will go through right the, the thing is the very important thing to understand is that what this has taught us is something about field theory okay the reason that it's working the way it is is because field redefinition variance if that's around your super symmetry scenario too which it will be right in terms of observables then the uh, perturbations to observables have to be field redefinition variant and that field redefinition variance means that they should boil down to geometric transfer functions geometric structures sorry kinematic transfer functions kinematic structures times dressings which are geometric this is a general lesson that we've learned in this particular example, and it will apply there as well. I mean, it'll, yes, it'll be constrained in terms of the operator forms you project onto. The Wilson coefficients will be constrained in how I would take your example and project it into this sort of language or a supersymmetric version of this language. You'll get patterns of Wilson coefficients, which will be there, which will be constrained, absolutely. But they will be packaged into geometric structures when they appear in observables because field redefinition variance is still there. And that's what's forcing them to be packaged into geometric structures. See, the thing is, things like this, if I go back here, sorry to go all the way back, it's not the cleanest example. So things like this, the reason it's appearing like this is because of that fewer definition variance. Okay, so in a particular operator basis, you change some of these individual entries around. But what doesn't change when you go from one operator basis to another with a field transformation, with a field variable change, is the fact that this geometric structure is there. You change the individual entries, but the combination remains. Okay, so then that's a very general lesson. And that applies to your example, it applies all over the place. It just projects out. And when you do renormalizable field theories, that's why we missed it for like decades, right? Because renormalizable field theories trivializes all the geometries. And, and so you, you, you just don't understand that's the big benefit that's, that's there. And also, it's not clear for me yeah. how this Riemann tensor, Riemann term character, appears in the It does. Yeah. So essentially, it appears in four point amplitudes. Yeah. So you can derive it, but it also has four indices. <laughs> so one thing that's one thing that's nice about this stuff is like you, you basically can you know, just write down the thing with the right number of indices for some endpoint function, and it's probably going to be that. <laughs> and that's exactly what happens. Sorry. You're not putting by hand, it just appears. No, it's amazing, actually. So what happens is that you can calculate in the operator basis. You can go in the, and just not see this stuff, right? And you can calculate an observable and do all the perturbations for Wilson coefficients for a particular observable, which has a four-point function. And then you look at the answer you get, and if you calculate it correctly, you can look at it. And then you can basically take the metrics and go through the Riemann curvature tensor and write it down directly. It's the same. It's non-trivial, but that's unpublished work. But that's actually what happens. And so it's like really it's like it's really there it's 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 not a accident it's really cleaning and it makes it so much easier to do the calculation than to go through like you know expand out to the operators because in the one case you're going through a field rede non redefinition invariant step it's like when you do gauge fixing in a stupid way right you break the gauge and you have to fix it it's the same thing if you go through field non redefinition invariant stuff and then get back to field redefinition invariant stuff you know there's a lot of cumbersome stuff there. Whereas if you just always have a language, which is the geometry, it's the stuff that's, that is what's closer to the field redefinition variance. And that's good because then you can basically do the calculations in a much more compactified way because you're not introducing spurious structure, which then projects out on the amplitude. Okay, so uh, no questions. If not, uh... Let's stand, Michael. Okay. Sure. Uh, probably just gonna uh, uh, you know, stay. Uh, just gonna you know visit our uh, department uh, tomorrow.
morning as well. So if you have any further, if you have a further questions, you can, uh, you know, uh, discuss you know, with questions, with mm -hmm. Mike, my role, or uh, if you get uh, further questions later, then just, you know, contact me and then uh, I guess. Just uh, email me, it's fine. Yeah. It's no problem. Uh, okay, so yeah, Great. thank you so much. Sure, thanks for the chance to talk.